Professor Katalin Kariko. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time today with us. Thank you. Katalin, please take us back to where your story started. I read about your childhood in Hungary and your interest in biology and your path to studying it. So what was it that drove you to this field? What made you interested in it? I think every child is interested in the nature, you know, they are in the flowers and the animals and uh, I am similar to them. So I learned when I was five years old the basic of biochemistry about the soap that is yeah. made from fat and soda and uh, yeah. I assisted uh, my mom when she cooked soap. Yeah, so it was a very early touch point with exactly. the whole field. Yeah. <laughs> So in 1985, you left Hungary actually to go to the US with your husband and your daughter to be in the science world there. And by 1990, you were already working on messenger RNA. Could you maybe explain to us in layperson terms, what exactly is messenger RNA? Scientists uh, discovered early on, you know, that the DNA has all of the information and uh, this is quite well known and it is in our body made with from protein and other things, but the life is at the DNA and protein. And what was in between was discovered 60 years ago, that was the RNA and the very specific messenger RNA, which codes for a protein. And it will go carrying the information from the nuclei to the place where the protein synthesis is uh, ongoing. And this is how we made the protein. So and please correct me if I'm wrong. What I read is that the messenger RNA today, we can um, design it in a way that it carries a recipe book to our cells and tells them which protein to make. Uh, from 1984 and 85, when the uh, first time uh, uh, synthetically in a tube the RNA could be made mm -hmm. and requires a template which can be synthesized and this is the DNA and then the RNA can be made using the four basic nucleotides in a tube mm -hmm. and this uh, RNA can be put on the cells or injected to the body and um, in a couple of minutes uh, the protein is made and uh, stop functioning. So it means that this kind of medicine is that homemade because our body will produce yeah. the product. Overall you've been working over 30 years on mm -hmm. messenger RNA actually. And I mean from an outsider's perspective you always think why did it take 30 years to to have these results now that we can use messenger RNA in vaccines with such a high efficiency the problem was that from the mRNA the mRNA is labeled and quickly degrade so the time when protein can be made from it is very limited and so that uh, many times uh, we could not see the biological effect of those proteins we expected to use and we had to improve the construct, uh, we had to figure out how to uh, wrap up that RNA to protect at least when it is outside the cell so it won't degrade so quickly and so gradually every time we get uh, better and better, sometimes incremental increase, sometimes big jump and then Eventually we get there that we could see biological effect when we inject a small amount of RNA in an animal, for example. And I can imagine that this was one of the high points in your journey, maybe the, when you first time saw it, it could be stable. And with your collaboration with Professor Weissman from the mm -hmm. University of Pennsylvania, right? Exactly. So, uh, but I have to say that when I could uh, uh, deliver the RNA in a cell and I could measure the effect. When we could uh, do, of course, in an animal, then we realized that probably maybe it would be good for human. And especially with Drew Weissman, colleague, we solved the problem of uh, immune activation by the RNA, changing one building block to another. And uh, then it opened the possibility to use the mRNA for therapy. Yeah. Uh, I was not thinking about vaccine at all. Yeah. I always wanted to use mRNA coding for therapeutic protein. Uh, that's how you came to BioNTech, right? Exactly. Switching a little bit of the sites within your field mm -hmm. from pure uh, academia and university mm -hmm. or institutions to the business side mm -hmm. of, of uh, science where you have a product at the end. of What drove you there and how did that feel to be now in a bit of a new environment? So I came here because uh, 2013 because I learned that 2012 uh, RNA was entered clinical trial. Mm -hmm. I want to use the modified RNA for therapeutic, that was uh, RNA for uh, cancer vaccine. Mm -hmm. But I thought that 
if somewhere could happen that the RNA will be, therapeutic RNA enter clinic, this will be here. By academia, the main goal was more paper and other things, but here, you know, in industry, we have to work together and uh, we have to have a functional product because uh, that is the goal in, in, the, in this kind of setting. Yeah. So that was, I was delighted. Yeah. All of us work together and then we get product which is uh, beneficial. And then you might have seen the high point of this collaboration when, uh, not when the corona pandemic hit, but when you saw that your colleagues from BioNTech were able to design the mRNA vaccine within hours of the Chinese scientists posting the COVID virus sequence on, mm -hmm. uh, in the papers. So how did that make you feel to see that you contributed to some kind of therapeutic or some kind of vaccine that could help so many people worldwide? I knew actually always that the vaccines will be so powerful because yeah. together with my colleagues back in the University of Pennsylvania also we could see whatever vaccine we were making and testing out animals, it was everything was so good, whether it was against influenza or Zika virus or others. I knew that it would be happened quickly and it can be done, uh, but mo mostly the public was not knowing and That's so true. I already realized that this is our role actually yeah. to educate the public, to tell what the molecular biologist is doing. And what really made you stick to that matter? So it is important uh, to stick to some project if you see the progress and I could see the progress that I could see that the RNA which at the beginning was uh, not many protein, not much protein was made. I could see that uh, it improved and we get more protein. We figured out formulation with purification, many, many different things. And every time we could see improvement and uh, believing that this improvement will lead to a final uh, uh, medical product, a drug, was, uh, seems like uh, in our reach. Yeah, yeah. And that kept us going. And for all the young scientists, mm -hmm. also young female scientists, mm -hmm. who might be also even met with additional biases mm -hmm. that might be harmful for innovation and progress, what would be your advice to them? First of all, I would tell them that they have to believe themselves. This is very important, especially I mentioned that I was coming from a small town and uh, going to the Ivy League school, you know, it can be intimidated or even just going with colleagues and everybody knows so many things and, and you could feel that uh, they know so much and you might settle for less. Don't do that. You know, just uh, believe in yourself that you will learn and progress and you can be better than anybody around. And uh, also to selecting uh, some kind of field that uh, uh, a job that you will be happy. Mm -hmm. They have to believe themselves, they have to enjoy what they are doing and uh, they have to focus on things which they can change, which they can do and do not worry about uh, other people around who might get uh, more salary and promote it or some and saying that oh life is not fair. Take it, life is not fair but you have to do the best out of it. Mm -hmm. Th those are beautiful <laughs> finished words. Thank you so much Katani for taking the time. And thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you.